Hello, this is uh, Gary. How's it going, Gary? It's uh, going swimmingly, actually. Um, you want to just uh, get started? Sure, absolutely. All right. So this is uh, Gary Dome talking to Phil Anderson, former U.S. Senate candidate, current chair of the Wisconsin Libertarian Party, and gubernatorial candidate. Thanks for talking with me, and uh, congratulations on officially getting on the ballot and your election as regional alternate. Um, Thanks. You're uh, running against Walker and one of, what, a dozen Democrats for governor? Um, I think it's probably smaller now, but how would you rate, uh, how would you rate Walker? How would you rate uh, Walker's performance in the office overall compared to other governors in the Midwest? Like, what are the best and worst things he's done in office? Well, May have lost him. Oh no. <laughs> um may have to hang up and call him right back. Are, are you Sorry. there? Oh, okay, you're in now. Sorry, Oh, that's it's all right. Where did I where did I drop you off? Uh you were talking about localized um control, um, especially with regard to like mining and uh, respect for private property rights. Okay, yeah, he's also trampled on uh, uh, local units of government, just about transportation as well. And the challenge has been that while he, that all these shortcomings have been pointed out by people that are conservatives, uh, the sense of the city of Wisconsin, they're having a hard time leaving in the terms of support because uh, we present a viable option. Good. 
you hear a lot of times that's a battle in itself, just getting included in the polls. Um, switching up. Right. Uh, switching over to health care, do you agree with the following statement that one of the main problems with modern day American health care system is that we have conflated health insurance with health care and use insurance more as a prepayment for most medical expenses rather than protection against catastrophic loss? Uh, why and why does it matter? Absolutely. Um, in what ways, if any, should the uh, state government of Wisconsin encourage the move of consumers or recipients towards vehicles like HSAs or subscription services for routine and preventative medicine? They haven't, as far as I'm aware. I've not had that absolutely. And I currently belong to a concierge service um, where I pay dollars a month and getting all of my routine care labs, uh, you know, prescription refills. We have to actually pay for the prescription, but, the, but that, that service from the doctor and the doctor's office for very inexpensive, very responsive um, uh, health care. And I would promote that uh, as governor, uh, not necessarily, um, you know, trying to get to some of the force of government, but, but encouraging, you know, market forces to, to uh, make those those options available and encouraging people to use them. I'm pulling them up as examples of the market for people. Right. Um, switching gears a bit, what are your uh, thoughts on school vouchers broadly and more specifically, what are the positives and negatives of the statewide voucher system in Wisconsin and how could it be improved? Well, we just unveiled an idea. I just did by Wisconsin High Interview for the Fifth Wisconsin. A nonprofit uh, that covers the state capital news. They they uh, broadcast the television and all that stuff, but they also record and disseminate candidate interviews um, to every election cycle. And during that interview last uh, Wednesday, the NFL plan which doesn't really have a catchy name yet, but it's going to be something like Open Enrollment for All. And it's to me, it's, it's the first part of a two-part strategy. What we're trying to do is break the stranglehold. And the, the public schools um, and, and and the teachers union have on have on people's taxpayer dollars and the right to choose what education is uh, best for their kids. So right now, um, anytime you open enroll from one public school district to another, uh, 
has children in public schools use that number, use that dollar amount to opt out, not only opt into a different public school, but opt out of the public school system altogether into a private school that they're choosing and without any strings attached. It's one of the flaws of the credit voucher system is that only you can't use it at any public school you want. It has to, there has to be certain restrictions on the sort of core issue, you know, where, where there's certain that which might be the reason uh, that you're opting out of public schools in the first place. Right, right. So it's not really a true choice system, and it's not available to everybody. So what our goal is, and what we'll kind of flesh out over the course of the next month or so, is this plan called Open Enrollment for All, which has a couple of features. Number one, it, it, there's no strings attached when you open enroll in a, in a private school. But the other thing is that, is that it's not just for you know, people can afford it or certain areas of the state. One of the major issues is people, you know, people are free to attend private schools if they can afford to. They're still paying for the public school. But the people that are served most poorly by the current public school system, mainly poor people, black people in Milwaukee and Madison, the city of Kenosha, and the urban areas of the city, are the ones who can least afford to opt out and where the public schools are the worst. So this is an opportunity for them to take taxpayer dollars that they're paying in as renters to keep them in general to be able to prevent our paying property taxes through the landlord who is actually paying for that to free them from that from that uh, imprisonment to the public school system and allow them to opt out and form solutions of their own and just have a market for different kinds of schools, especially in urban areas where people have been so uh, abused by the current political structure. Right. Uh, what's your pitch to voters who philosophically align more with you, but are afraid of the consequence of your support swaying the election away from a major party candidate they prefer and towards one they despise more? Well, it, it's a difficult thing, you know, and, and to be honest, the first thing we need to present is viability. So we're, we've been very careful uh, by last, well, the Senate election as well as this one. With crafting messages where people don't feel like we're going to pull out the vote from, you know, or completely dismantle government on election cycle or whatever. So there's that viability thing. But there's also, you know, we encourage people to not be held captive by the two party system as well. And although I'm very careful about using this analogy, um, it's, it's very much like an abusive relationship where if you are, if every person, and we know this as libertarians, every person. Uh, in the United States is being abused by their government in some way, shape, or form. Uh, some more than others, but uh, certainly the, it's a, that abuse is there. And if you don't, if you're not willing to leave, you'll always be abused. And so what I would argue to you is, is that we get back to your first question, those constituencies that feel like, and, and are rightfully feel that, that, uh, that water doesn't really extremely do any of that activity and is, is, is covering the wind, so to speak. The force of, a, of an attack from the left. Those people, in particular, in some cases, not only do they talk about voting libertarian, talk about voting for me, but in the end, they don't. Um, more people, at least, consider the option of Wisconsin gun owners, Wisconsin concealed carry, um, you know, the property owners, in Wisconsin, any you know, Wisconsin Taxpayers Association. If they look at, look, this is an option. The libertarian candidate is an option because we're not being served well by the public. Then, then, then that at least that's an opportunity for us to get more votes and for more people to consider it as an option. And we can consider that understanding the law as it's being elected. Um, it may sway the next governor, whether they're a Republican or a Democrat, to at least want to address those populations that they may be and address.
just getting in our phones, we can influence the situation and stop them. I, uh, I live in Kenosha County where the governor denied approval for building a hard rock casino that would have been constructed without the use of state funds. He was able to do so because our state constitution, which uh, attempted to prohibit casino gambling, resulted in a set of laws giving the executive branch authority to approve or disapprove a casino owned by tribes unilaterally. Knowing what, uh -huh. you do, uh, knowing what you do about the deal, would you have approved construction had you been governor at the time? Yeah, they, especially especially because of another more taxpayer funds. You know, the, the, the tribe to the people that make the local decisions should be free to do what they want. Period. The, uh, speaking of local representatives with that casino, um, my representative in the state assembly fought for the approval of the casino, even if it was a decision for Walker. However, when I brought up the idea of amending our state constitution to fully legalize uh, casinos, she seemed to think it was a waste of time. The process requires passage by two separate legislative sessions, one after the passage of an election. Would uh, pursuing such a change be a lost cause, or would it be a battle worth fighting? Well, for me as governor, it would be a battle worth fighting because it's a basic issue. People being able to provide some issues and make the decisions for themselves. Now, looking at the political landscape, you know, your representative may have been correct in that there's there's a lot of opposition to that, but I'm not afraid of that sort of opposition. And as a libertarian governor, I can I can use leverage against you know, between the two parties to get certain things done. That would be one of them to fight that fight in, in a way that uh, that it can be accomplished. Because I don't, I'm not playing on either side of the of the fence. I can, I can broker a deal and win votes uh, other ways. Uh, you've been critical of the Foxconn deal, mostly from a crony capitalist standpoint. Um, could you speak to the specifics of why, especially on issues revolving around environmental concerns and eminent domain abuse? Well, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I'm not a big fan of a lot of environmental regulations that are, at least the way that the state goes about them. I do believe that at least, at least in the short term, the state plays a role in unfolding people's property rights. And that speaks to both the environmental concerns of Foxconn as well as eminent domain. Eminent domain, you know, in the, in the Constitution, it's kind of hard to fight the concept, although it's been you know, crazily abused across the United States for a long time. Um, so I consider that the Constitution a flawed document, and that was the reason that one was done. But, uh, but the, the state has a role in defending property rights for people who would be polluted, who their water would be, would be polluted. Who their access to, you know, if their access to water is changed, um, you know, and, and, and Foxconn's not the only issue in that regard. There's currently a, uh, a mine being uh, begun up at the at the far end of the Menominee River uh, that's trying to pollute that river and pollute uh, a couple of counties up there. Passed resolutions uh, against that, but the state hasn't stepped in and done anything to defend their property rights. Of people, you know, that even represented a county a county referendum. So. Um, in that regard, specifically to Foxconn, we understand government as supporting those rights constitutionally understood and spelled out. And there is a role for the state to have that is advocated in incorporating this deal with Foxconn, and that, that's just two examples of the uh, environmental issue and the uh, and, and domain issue. It's really attractive. Yeah. Uh, last of my questions. Um, What's your favorite drink, your favorite shot, and your favorite Star Wars movie? Uh, favorite drink. Right now, I don't have a particular scotch, but I really like a Highland, good Highland scotch. And I'm going to be in Scotland starting this Friday and going on a trip with my son over there. We kind of acquired two of this thing on a chaperone, so I'm looking at some really good scotch. Um, I don't know if I have a good shot. Uh, to be honest with you, I like it just a good shot of whiskey, I guess. I'm not a big, not a big fan of tequila, uh, but I'll drink a shot of vodka or, or two. You know, if it's good vodka. And the last question was my favorite. Favorite Star Wars, Wars movie? Oh, probably Empire Strikes Back. I like all of them in, in different ways, but that's the one uh, back when it came out. I was going to come out in 1981 or something like that. Uh, only about yeah, 77 was uh, New Hope. I think 81 was the, uh, yeah, I think 81 was Empire, wasn't it? 
I don't know. <laughs> Actually, uh, uh, speaking of currently getting a tattoo of the Millennium Falcon on my rib cage from the new Solo movie, which brings me to, uh, I'm here with award-winning tattoo artist Glenn Morrison of Dead Setting, who would Hi. like to maybe ask you a question. Glenn? Hey, how's it going, man? Hey, how's it going? Uh, pretty good. So what's your take on legalizing marijuana? All right, I'm going to give you a uh, Pretty much decriminalizing it. Pretty much decriminalizing it. Yeah.
All right, Ben. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, I appreciate uh, your thoughts on all these issues and uh, look forward to uh, voting for you in November. All right, we'll do, man. Thank you. All right. <laughs> all right. Talk to you later.